4, 32 to 37, the believers share their possessions. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Acts 2 42 to 47. The Fellowship of the Believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had needs. Every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Hi, we're Gavin and Anne Calver and we are absolutely delighted to be spending the next few mornings with you. We're gonna be exploring this book, which we wrote and we think is pretty good and we're really excited about and we'd love you to go to the Spring Harvest website now and get hold of one if you haven't already. And please do consider also getting one for someone else who you also would love to see unleashed into being part of the Acts Church today. We're also going to explore this book, which we've written that book out of. Um, so if you want to have your Bibles open in front of you, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. We're going to be talking about Unleashed Together this morning. Yeah, and, and what's amazing, I think, is we never dreamt how relevant this would all be. No. We never really realised. When we were coming up with this theme, we're both on the Spring Harvest planning group. I, I chair that group. And whenever we come up with these themes, it's usually a two-year process. Mm -hmm. We seek the Lord. What does he want for, for the event at that time? What does he want in that context? And we felt really clearly there was a message about the church being unleashed, the church being scattered to every town, village and community, about us gathering in order to then be taught about scattering. But instead, we're in the ultimate scattering time. And it really feels quite prophetic. Yes, it does. It, it's been absolutely incredible to think that what we kind of wrote, what we dreamt about, we really sensed the Lord speak to us, didn't we? And now here we are literally scattered to our own homes, literally all of us watching at home in different spaces. The church has left the building and here we are talking about being unleashed. And what we want to do is, is just recap a little bit um, briefly on Unleashed Power, which was the first night's theme last night, and then move into being unleashed together um, this morning. The reality is that the Unleashed Power piece runs all the way through the week. We're not just going to um, make the Holy Spirit bit last night. The Holy Spirit is part and parcel of everything that, that we're going to bring to you um, through the morning. So why don't we just pray together before we, we press on. And Lord, our, our heart cry is that you would come, that you would come, that you would move by your spirit um, in a way that we could never have imagined was possible. We ask, Lord, that you would fill us right now, that you would minister to our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls with your word to us, Father. Lord, we're going to talk, but we pray that it would be your living word that would come through and every single one of us would be transformed through encounter with you this week. Mm. And we just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So like you said, Anne, this Unleashed Power piece, it runs through the whole week. Yeah. We don't stop at any point. That runs through the children's programmes, the youth programmes, yeah. the Big Start, everything. That Unleashed Power is fundamental. But also today, we do want to dip in a bit into it, what it means to be an unleashed people, yes. to go together, to go with others, to be part of a people doing this as one. So let, let's kind of recap a little bit on last mm. night, but then also press into that. Absolutely. Do you want to recap a bit for yeah, us? Yeah, so, I mean, you, you want to look down at Acts yourselves, please do that. Um, but in Acts chapter 1, um, you know, we see this incredible moment where Jesus ascends into heaven and then the disciples are there in that space going, he's gone, like our, our Lord, our Saviour's gone, now, now what do we do? Um, and there's this reality that I think the disciples will have felt afraid 
really afraid. Um, you know, persecution was breaking mm. out, mm. and and they would have been huddled together, going, "What do we do now? Like, what's going to happen next?" And and there's an amazing thing that does happen in the sense that they gather together in prayer. They press in together in prayer. You know, the spring harvest theme last year was prayer, yeah, yeah. wasn't it? Which is interesting. Um, but but now we're thinking about being together, the Acts Church today, and they're huddled together, and then the Holy Spirit mm. comes, mm. and and the wind blows and the fire comes and the people of God are completely transformed. I mean, they're, they're no longer just afraid, huddled together, wondering what's coming next, but they're empowered out. The church leaves the building, doesn't it? And that, that's just fascinating when you think where we are today. Well, yeah, we wrote this thinking that it was going to speak into a context where we would be talking about being sent out. Yeah. But we have been sent out. The situation's very different. But right now we find ourselves absolutely pushed out into our, our homes and our mm-hmm. communities. Yes, there are social distancing rules, which, yes, you should obey. But we are seeing our neighbours more than ever. Yeah. It might be over a fence, but they're there. We feel more present in our community. There's a greater sense, isn't there, of us being unleashed set free from what we're used to yes. and set into a different place. Yes. It may not always feel freeing. It's really hard, but it's, but it's an interesting space we find ourselves in. Also, this book of Acts, it's not mm. called Facts. It's called Acts. It so it's, it's not it's not real. Let's get that clear. Luke was <laughs> yeah. an eyewitness. It's all good. But but it's time for, to look at a lot of Acts. What did people do when they stepped out and mm. acted? What would that look like for us? Mm-hmm. And I think for us, it's time for Act 2. Mm, cool. You know, Acts... The book of Acts doesn't finish perfectly at Acts 28. It finishes as an untold ending. It does. We are the Acts 29 church. Mm-hmm. We are to live out what it means to be the Acts church today. And I don't know about you, Anne, that gets me quite excited. It, it does. I mean, I think I feel a strange fear in that. Like, I feel like, you know, what is coming? Like, what are we in? And what's going to come? And actually, that I really want to walk in step with God and with one another. And, and I don't know, I've been so aware actually that that this togetherness piece that we see in Acts, like this incredible supernatural togetherness that's demonstrated that we're going to look at um, in more detail in a minute, you know, that actually we, we've been separated and moved mm. to our homes, but there's been a, a supernatural sense of togetherness, even though we're not physically together. Mm. And I I don't know what's happened in your churches, in your scenarios, um, in your streets, but what we've been aware of is that actually we feel really aware that relationship is the most important thing, that actually relationship with God, number one, and relationship with one Mm. another has become you know, the most important thing. There's been a lot of things where we've gone, why were we doing that? Like, what yeah. What was that for? Yeah. Like, why were we focused on that? Yeah. You know, actually, it's people. People, and that is the greatest commandment yeah. after all, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Love, love God and love your neighbour as yourself. And I think that we're seeing something beautiful worked out in that way. Yeah, and we're starting to realise what really matters. <clears throat> you know, people are concerned for the health of themselves and others. People are concerned for the well-being of those around them. Yeah. It's a great chance to be a better neighbour. Yes. But also it's a church was never meant to be an hour and a half on a Sunday morning, followed by good or in some cases bad coffee. (laughs) It was always meant to be a community of people existing for the transformation of their society. And it almost feels like um, we're being unleashed into an army ready to go. Mm -hmm. And and some of the stuff that we're used to is being stripped back. Mm -hmm. And it's time to actually say, well, what do we have in common and how do we journey together? Mm -hmm. Where's this new togetherness coming from? Reminds me of that time I went to visit the Bruderhof, mm. just uh, south of London wow. in Robertsbridge. And it really challenged me. The Bruderhof is an evangelical community based all over the world. And they live in community. They live. They try to be the Acts 2 church. <laughs> so what they do is they share everything. Yeah. They, um, no one's poor, but no one's rich. You don't have your own car. You don't, you, you're in community. Um, no one retires. No one dies alone. There's a real sense of commonality and common purpose. And at first it just feels amazing. But then you start thinking, what would that mean for me? Because mm. you basically have nothing is your own. Everything is the communities. Mm-hmm. And many of your choices are taken away from you. But it's, it's communal living for the benefit of the whole. Yeah. And yeah. it's an incredible thing to consider. But also massively challenging. Yeah, massively. Massively. And I, and I think that, that that was the kind of togetherness mm. that we see. I mean... 
Um, I'm not sure that they were maybe as in as the Bruderhof, like they were yeah. more sent out, um, weren't they? But but that what the Bruderhof shows is this incredible love um, and, and selfless, sacrificial mm. way of giving and supporting one another. Wouldn't that be amazing to see more of that um, in our day? I think, you know what interests me is I was saying to Gab just yesterday, that a week or two ago, a friend of mine who I respect highly messaged me on my phone and just said, Anne, it's time to disrupt mm. your thinking. It's time to disrupt your thinking. And the coronavirus hadn't kicked in, um, at, like really kicked in at that point. The schools hadn't closed. And, and it was just, I was just a bit like, oh, I need to disrupt my thinking. And I just thought, as I sort of dwelt on that, I've, and I've been feeling for quite a long time, that in terms of what we understand as church, that needs to be disrupted. Mm. Um, in terms of the way that church has looked for generations, the Lord is saying, I want you to think differently and I want you to think in a new way. And actually, we've, without even meaning to, without even planning yeah, yeah. to, we've, we've found ourselves in that space. And I think God wants to do a new thing. You know, we can't return to Egypt, can no. we, in a sense? Um, we're headed for a promised land and, and there's something new that's being birthed, but, but it's about going there together because because we can't go alone. No, and we can't just go back to normal. No. You know, um, I'm a keen reader of all kinds of things going on in culture, and you look at sort of things being written, and, and the basic reality of any crisis is you can't go back to normal. Mm. So there's, there's many people, I've been chatting to hundreds of church leaders because of my role at the Evangelical Alliance, we're connecting with church leaders to check sure, make sure everyone's okay. Mm. And there was a number struggling already with the idea that things can't just go back to normal. Because they're sort of desperately waiting for the, the building to open again, everything just to return to normal. That doesn't happen when there's this kind of shaking. Mm -hmm. Things change and things look different forever. So we need to start asking what kind of church is needed after the virus or during the virus? Mm -hmm. What kind of leadership's needed? What kind of Christians are needed? And really, you can't help but come to a conclusion that it's an unleashed people where everyone's involved. You see, when the spirit moves on people, all kinds of things happen. When he moves through them, the results are awesome. Mm -hmm. Luke records 120 believers in Jerusalem 30 days after the resurrection. So 120 believers in 30 days. Mm. It's a slowish start, but that is a medium-sized yeah, church. Pretty good, pretty good. 120 yeah. in 30 days. You'd be pretty pleased with that, wouldn't you, in your community? 120 in 30 days. But then, bang! <laughs> 3,000 believers added in one day. Hallelujah. Imagine if that happened, like, putting on. that in spring harvest terms. That's like... The whole of the big top mm -hmm. or the whole of the skyline being one for Jesus. That many people in one moment. That would be amazing. Or in my world, that is the whole of the AFC Wimbledon. Average attendance in one moment coming to Jesus. Imagine that in your community, in your town. You know, some of us need to extend our prophetic imagination for what's possible when the spirit comes in power and equips us yes. and enables us yes. and does it together. Yes. I must now calm Amen. down. No, but I am so excited on. about what would that look like oh. in my community for 3,000 people in one day to come to faith. That same God, that same spirit is here with us now. Mm. Hallelujah. Yeah, and we're, and we're longing for that. We are absolutely longing for that, longing to see transformation, longing to see the Spirit breathe life, longing for another Pentecost. You know, we see here, don't we, at Pentecost, soon after Pentecost, just this army rising. And it, it's it's the Ezekiel army. You know, it's Ezekiel 47. It's mm -hmm. those bones mm -hmm. that have been breathed to life and rising as an army and advancing into the neighbourhood and thousands are getting saved. And I think just as we, we've penned this and thought about this, that is our heart cry again, that we would see the breath of the living God breathe fire upon on his children mm. again and that we would arise like an army and advance in a new way through this season and, and that's our prayer just for that equipping together you know our good friend um Pete Hughes wrote a book didn't he all things new all things new um and he was talking about the church the greek word for the new testament church which is ecclesia ecclesia and actually when you split ecclesia into two you've got ek and ecclesia and ek actually means out of, and klesia means called, called. And so the reality of the church of the New Testament mm. were that they were the called out ones. Mm. They weren't called in to the building, they were called 
out in the power of God and we are right there in that space now and we just pray that, that the Spirit would come and just enable us to move out together to be those sent ones that God longs for us to be. It's exciting isn't it's it? Really it exciting. It's exciting but it's also the hallmarks of the early church were quite simple. There's four mm. things in um, Acts 2 verse 44, 42 it says they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. Mm. So teaching is really important mm -hmm. but secondly to fellowship Thirdly, to the breaking of bread. And fourthly, to prayer. It's very simple. Very simple hallmarks. They're not saying that our hallmarks are a building, mm. a mass gathering, though let's be honest, we miss some of those. Yeah, we do. Um, ordination, hierarchy, maintenance. No, the togetherness was these four things. And it's the empowering of the Holy Spirit and his presence that makes it possible for them to do these four. Mm. Teaching was important, that their knowledge, understanding and discipleship would grow. Fellowship was important, that the community would love one another and love those beyond themselves. Breaking of bread was important, that they would remember this great thing that Jesus had just done for them. And prayer was important, that they would grow more intimate with God, but also pray for those who didn't yet know him. This is simple stuff, friends. But what does this look like today? What does it look like for us to commit ourselves to teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer? Yeah, I'm so challenged by this bit, Gav, because... You know, I, I wonder what we've made church to be. I wonder actually what God wants us, wants to strip away mm -hmm. in this season, what needs to be left behind, because this is the stuff that's important that Gav's just highlighted. This is the stuff of the early church that we need to grab hold of again. I'm sure we're all doing it, mm -hmm. like breaking bread, having mm -hmm. fellowship, praying and hearing teaching, but actually that those were the fundamental things empowered by the spirit of God, and then they saw transformation come. And I I wonder whether we've, we've added things into the mix of church and made it something that God never intended it to be. And this is a moment to leave behind the old and embrace the new. You know, I, I believe that, that what we're living in as the church or what we were living in couldn't contain or house what was kind of come. I, I'm not sure that what is on the horizon, what is coming we were ready for and and i think uh, my prayer is is that lord make us ready as you're doing this because i don't know we we won't return mm. to what was we're walking towards something new and, and there's a shaking like you mentioned already um that are shaking out of our comfort zones mm. in every way mm. that's happening and you know what the enemy would intend for harm the lord's going to use it for good mm. can i just share about yeah do share share your strange childbirths Thing. <laughs> oh, forgive me. I, I just I, I had coronavirus a few weeks ago and it was it was really bad. Um a couple of weeks back and, and I had really bad back pain, lower back pain at some at one point, and I'm sure if you've had it you you'll know what I mean. Some of the pains in your body um, are really challenging. And I had this lower back pain and I was sort of having this discussion with the Lord, like, why? Why have I got this pain in my back, Lord? I, I really, why can it, can it just go away? What is it? What is it, Lord? And I just felt him say to me, it's birth pains, Anne. It's birth pains. And I was like, it's birth pains, like trigger word in terms of the Bible and, and thinking, you know, when birth pains are recorded, it talks about famines and earthquakes and, and rumors of wars and wars. And these are some of the, uh, the early signs that Jesus is on his way back. Um, we're not we're not putting a date or a time on Jesus's return, but that's what you know. I dug into scripture and had a look at that. But I was thinking, actually, birth pains in your back, Lord, and I, in my mind, you know, they're in your belly. You labour in your belly, and and you give birth. But actually, all my labour, having Amelie, my daughter, was in my back. It was in my back, and and I think that. What's interesting with birth pains is that they lead towards new life. Mm. Actually, yes, it's painful and uncomfortable and difficult, but mm. new life comes off the back of it. And I think we're probably going to see other birth pains mm. that are going to come. Um, this is not necessarily the only one, but what we can be assured of is it's leading us to new life. Wow. That we're on the way to something beautiful and new and exciting and i think our prayer is that together we would leave behind whatever we need to leave behind yeah no agreed mm. agreed and it acts everyone acts yes there's no sense of just a priest or just the trained they all participate mm -hmm. 
The word together is used three times in six verses. Wow. Not independently, we go together. Not on my own, we go together. Not for my own devices. No, we go together. Mm-hmm. And we can be apart now, but we're together in what we're wanting. We're together in our mission to see the gospel reach the nations. We have the same call to go together, not independently. This is a challenge. You're quite independent. I'm very <laughs> independent. It's Sometimes we want to go our own way, but actually in Acts, people go together. Mm. And we need to start going more together. There should be no such thing as a lonely Christian or an isolated Christian or a solitary Christian. I love the fact that Christianity goes beyond ethnicity or or gender or age or anything else. I have the great privilege in some of my ministry of speaking in some places where, where you know, I might be the only white person in a gathering of thousands or, or you might be being translated or other stuff. The church goes beyond the boundaries that human beings put in place. But we must never just do that. We must go together with as many people as we can because it's the church of God. We are called to move together, not on our own. Yeah, and it was making me think about, you know, what is the togetherness that's arising right now for us? And, you know, one of the things that's been significant has been our team Zooms Mm, every mm. day. And um, Gav does a nine o'clock one with the EA. Mm. I have an 11 o'clock one with our team. And and just gathering together in that way has been significant. You know, we, we were gathering once a week in the church that, we, that I was in mm. before, but the church right now is an everyday church gathering every day. It's not that Sunday service. And, and you've been really together, haven't you? Well, we have um, four offices. So we've got an office in Scotland, one in Wales and one in Northern Ireland. But then we've also got a bigger office in London. And so what you've had previously, with the London office would have prayed every day together mm. and the, the nation's offices would have prayed every day, but never all together. And we've got this incredible Zoom chat with like 45 of us. And one minute you've got a Northern Irish accent and then you've got a Scottish accent, a Welsh accent, a Nigerian accent or whatever. But, but you've got this incredible togetherness mm. where we're all in different places, but we're all in it together, sharing a common purpose of wanting to make Jesus known. Mm. So just to think about in what ways are you seeing togetherness come where mm. you are? You know, I was reading recently on um, this book, Marks of a Movement. Um, it's by Winfield Bevins. If you've seen it, it's brilliant. Um, but, but it's interesting. It talks about the Wesleyan revival and actually that it began with this reality that, that Wesley realised that the old wineskin of the Church of England couldn't contain the new wine that God was giving birth to. And so what happened was... Hang he, on, hang on, disclaimer there. Okay. That's the old Church of England, the not old the current Church of England, one. Not the current one. We love the Church <laughs> of England. But just that what, what they were seeing, the old con- containment, the old vehicle wasn't going to work for the new that was being birthed. And I think that really spoke to us, didn't it, Gab? Because actually the, the God is doing something new and actually what together do we need to say, this is a... F- this is a priority and this is a focus going forward. And what do we need to say? Do you know what? We've got to leave that wine skin behind and we've got to put that that thing down now. Um, and it might be, you know, just that you're going, actually, why were we wasting our time doing that? Why were we thinking so much along those lines when actually this is what God is birthing now? Um, and I think our, our challenge and our hope and for ourselves as well is that we keep stepping fearlessly into what's coming and not into what was. Yeah, you know what? It's going to need all of us. Mm. You know, James watching in Wolverhampton, it's going to need you. Margaret watching in Keswick, it's going to need you. Mm. You know, um, Jeffrey watching in Belfast, it's going to need you. Mm. But whoever we are, wherever we are, if we're part of the family of God, this move is going to need all of us. Mm. And for the body to work, we're going to have to stop comparing ourselves to each other. You know, I think comparison is the root of so many problems. Yeah. You either feel better about yourself because you push someone else down or you feel worse about yourself because you've elevated someone else. No one's winning out of that. What we need to start doing is accepting that we're all needed. We're all important. We're all absolutely vital to this. Yeah. Without you, it doesn't work. Without me, it doesn't work. We need the whole body released to make a difference together. Mm. We've got to stop this comparison. You know, and any of you who are old time spring harvesters, you'll know my dad was one of the co-founders of Spring Harvest. And for the first 10 years of my ministry, I was constantly compared to him. You know, it doesn't help. It doesn't help him. It doesn't help me. I remember preaching at his church in America and someone said to me that when my dad preaches, sorry, when I preach, it's like my dad preaching with a sense of humour. But when my dad preaches, it's like me preaching with a brain. 
And you know what? No one wins out of that. It's not nice. Comparison's not helpful. We're all unique. When God made you, he threw the mold away. Not because it was broken, but one of you was enough. You're amazing. You're brilliant. But you need to be part of this. And so do I. And we need to not compare each other to one another. We need to thank God for making both of us so the body can work. Mm. You know, I love Anne dearly. She's amazing. But I'm glad there's only one of Anne. Because, you know, (laughs) one of any person is enough. And what we need to stop doing is comparing and start instead of comparing, we need to start collaborating, working together, working alongside each other. In John 17, Jesus prays that the church might be one that the world would believe. It's that kind of oneness we need to be part of. And for that oneness to work, we need to not compare. We need to delight in one another and we need to journey forward together. Wow. Oh man, I'm glad there's only one of you guys. Ah, thank you. <laughs> but uh, as we draw to a close, I just just refer back to these passages again in chapter two and chapter four. You know, we see so many words of unity mm. recorded in these verses, and they don't make this unity happen by themselves. This is the spirit of the living God bringing them together in a supernatural way. So we, you know, you have a look at them later maybe, but we see everyone written. We see everything. We see all. We see one. We mm. see them all. And and there's no question of, of it being a sum of the body and not all of them. It's every single one of them playing their part and empowered by the king, empowered by the Lord. And, and they, they have have everything in common mm. which is fascinating so it's like they were moving together as one there, there wasn't just the pastor mm. and the teacher you know and everybody else was was just watching and listening they were all participating they weren't passengers they were participators they all had a role to play and and the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists were included in that and released and empowered and and not comparing with mm. one another but loving and, and every generation no matter what age Um, No matter whether there was somebody who was ill, no matter whether there was somebody who was old, no matter what background somebody was from, they were moving in the power of the spirit together. And I think that that is something that we just need to look at in this time. And and, because I believe that that actually God is leveling the ground um, here and he's doing away with hierarchy. And he's saying, do you know what, my children, you're all of equal value in my kingdom. And he's taking down the high places and he's just saying, work together to see my kingdom come and my will be done. And I think just just as we kind of draw to a close, we, we've just been feeling, haven't we, that that who is hungry for what we're hungry for, that that's an important thing, something you read, Gav, wasn't it? Yeah, I was listening to John Tyson, who's an Australian pastor based in New York, and he said, "Um, don't just surround yourself with people that agree with you. Surround yourself with those who are hungry for what you're hungry for. Mm -hmm. So I guess the challenge is, what are you hungry for? I'm hungry to see the evangelisation of the United Kingdom, to see the church rise up in this land, to see many people come to faith in a powerful way, Mm -hmm. to see the government, the NHS, everything else transformed for Jesus, and to see the UK on its knees before its saviour. If you're hungry for that, let's hang out. Mm -hmm. If you're not hungry for that, find people that are hungry for what you're hungry for, and ask the Lord to be hungry for that too. Yeah, and I think that those people that would go, do you know what, I can't do what Gab does, but I feel that same call, so maybe I could do this to contribute to seeing that happen. You know, my heart cry is the church would burn with the power of God. My heart cries that the church would look like the early church and we would see a mighty move of God through his church, through his body in the United Kingdom. So, yeah, maybe spend a bit of time just thinking, what am I hungry for and who is God linking your heart with and your mind with right now who are you connecting with and you're going oh we're on the same page and the Holy Spirit's doing something in this relationship with them and I need to pay attention to that and how can I pray into what God is saying to both of us in this season for what lies ahead bless you guys we're we're just going to pray together Mm -hmm. yeah and, um, and then we're just going to be back in a short time with the Yes But Hows. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that we don't have to strive to create togetherness, 
that we don't have to, to strive to create something of our own making. We thank you that your mighty hand is at work in this season during the coronavirus, that you're doing something beautiful in the midst of pain, that you are doing something incredible with your church. And Father, we pray that you would come and that you would fill us, Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would bring us together in a supernatural way. And Father, that we would welcome every gift and release every gift, that we would do away with hierarchy and that we would not return to the church that was, but move towards the church that you want us to be, Lord Jesus. And we just ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 In the book, at the end of each chapter, we did a yes, but how. And we'll come back to that in a moment when we want to look at some of how, how might this work out in our lives at this time. But away from Spring Harvest, I am the CEO of the Evangelical Alliance, which is the oldest and largest unity organisation in the United Kingdom, seeking to represent and draw together the two million evangelicals in this country. We're made up of 4,000 member churches, 500 organisations, and tens of thousands of individuals who come together to say, together, let's make Jesus known. You know, an evangelical is someone who believes the Bible's the inspired word of God. The death and resurrection of Jesus is the most important thing in human history. There is a need for conversion. And finally, we want to be active in the world, making the world more like the kingdom. And at the EA, we've recently, we've ripped up our strategic plan. We've said, no, we are going to be people that share the gospel, that raise our voice in the corridors of power and that support our membership. And we are desperate more than ever to make an impact at the moment during this virus. But to do that, would you give us your voice too? Yes. Would you consider for the price of a cup of coffee a month, three pound a month, becoming a personal member of the Evangelical Alliance? If you do so, we would be most grateful. You would be standing with thousands of others and we together would be able to transform this nation and change this culture to be more like the kingdom. We're about to watch a short video about EA membership. If you're interested in signing up, go to eauk.org forward slash join us. Please join, please stand with us, and please let's together make Jesus known in the United Kingdom. God bless you. Have you heard of the Evangelical Alliance? Ever wondered what we're for? We're all for unity. When we look around, we are heartbroken to see the nations we love riddled with division. Division in families, division in political parties, division in communities. But we are all for painting a different picture. One of a growing, vibrant, united church, colourful and diverse, and standing firmly on God's word. We are here to fulfil Jesus' prayer that we might become the family of God united. One people, one voice, one hope. We're all for advocacy. When the world questions the relevance of our faith, we demonstrate to the UK parliaments and assemblies how Christians are absolutely good news for society. We tell stories of how the church is housing the homeless, feeding the hungry and bringing much needed public leadership to towns and cities. We give voice to the church, speaking out on the issues that matter. When our faith is being pushed to the sidelines, we want to graciously and coherently fight for the religious liberty of all. We challenge the story. We say there's a better way. And we're all for mission. In a broken, hopeless world, we show how Jesus changes everything. We want to see many people invited into a relationship with him because salvation through Jesus is the best thing possible. We exist to unite the church in evangelism and equip people like you to share your faith with confidence and boldness. We encourage the whole church to play a part in fulfilling the awesome challenge that is the Great Commission. What is the Evangelical Alliance for? We are for you, the Jesus-following teachers, police officers, CEOs, farmers, doctors, church leaders, artists, factory workers, retailers and journalists who are busy being salt and light in the world. We are for you, so join us. I hope you enjoyed the video. Welcome back. We're Gavin and Ann Calver and we have loved sharing with you a bit from Acts 2 and Acts 4 this morning. And as promised, at the end of each morning, we then want to do a little yes, but how section. So it's taken at the, at the end of each chapter, we've done a yes, but how. Because you can read great Christian books and you can read average Christian books too. And you get to the end and you're like, yeah, but what does that mean in my life? Yeah. So we've tried to ground that and we wanted to just 
cover a little bit of that quickly now. So on page 41, at the end of the Walking on Water chapter, one of the Yes About How things to consider is, inspired by our friend and fellow Spring Harvest leader, Chris Rogers, he challenged us both recently when he said, it, when it comes to being unleashed, many of us need to change our intentionality, not just do more. When it comes to our efforts, he says that we need to look for things that are low maintenance, high impact, not high maintenance, low impact. And it's challenged us because as you hear stuff like you'll be hearing this week, you start thinking, I can't do any more, I'm knackered, I've got nothing more to give. And actually, maybe for some of us, it's a change of intention, not doing more. We're not looking to say, let's just work harder, let's just do more. We're saying, actually, where do we need to realign, recalibrate or change? So where might you right now need to change your emphasis in order to be a greater steward of the time and efforts you have available to you? Yeah, I, I think it's about thinking in this season, what does God want me to do? What is it that he's empowered me to do? You know, in actual fact, I found um, that I've been a lot more still mm. um, in this time, that I've actually been on my back ill um, for quite a lot of this time. But what the Lord seems to do with me in that is, is take the opportunity to speak more um, and to reveal his purposes, which then hopefully I can then encourage and bless other people through what I'm hearing. What is it that he's bringing to the fore for you in this season? And how can you together work out how you bless one another? The, the other thing that we've been doing is, is gathering as a family around the table and sharing the Bible with one another and praying for one another um, and waiting on the Lord. And actually that's framed our day really well, mm. hasn't it, mm. in the morning. So maybe you could have a little think about, you know, what can we do together for one another in this season? Yeah, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Let's move on, shall we? Yeah. Do you want to do the next one? So which one did you want to say? I reckon this one's pretty good, don't you? So, okay, so this is page 73 of Unleashed. And um, we just talk in the Yes But How here about extending your prophetic imagination and thinking, you know, what new ways could we, we try to reach other people? Mm. Um, this is right up your street, isn't it, Carver? Um, what new ways we can, we can share uh, the gospel in this season? I mean, maybe even the idea of that's like, what are they talking about? You know, I'm sat at home behind the closed door. How can I share the gospel right now? I can't touch somebody to pray for them. I can't share the gospel face to face, I've got to stand two metres away. You know, what, what would you say? Well, I've not <laughs> often shared the gospel from much closer than two metres away. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a number of ways you can share the gospel. Some of our unity shares the gospel, some of our works share the gospel, but some of our words do as well. Mm. And I think for some of us, instead of saying, I'm locked in my house, I can't do this, I can't do that, I'm limited in this, there's nothing I can do. Mm. Maybe we need to extend our prophetic imagination to say, well, what is possible? What can I do? A bit like when you were ill with coronavirus and you were like, actually, what I can do is pray. So I will lie in my bed and I will pray. Mm. What can you do today? And I think for so many of us, we just see closed opportunities. The thinker Edmund Burke once said, one person sees an open door, the other sees it slammed shut. And I think as Christians, we're called to see the open door, the opportunity, the possibility. Where might the Lord be challenging us to reach out at this time? Yeah, I mean, I've seen some amazing things of you, people writing these WhatsApp notes and getting WhatsApp groups yeah. on their street. And, you know, actually being outside and clapping the NHS was an incredible moment of togetherness. You know, what are the ways as the church that we can demonstrate togetherness, that we can demonstrate the gospel to our neighbour, that we can unite as one to share the gospel in this season? Yeah, and also, I don't mean capitalise, but but certainly make the most of the fact that people are talking about stuff they wouldn't normally talk about. Mm. Being honest, I think this is the greatest evangelistic moment in my lifetime. And part of that is, you'll notice on social media, how many people are talking about prayer? That's interesting. Yeah. You know, it was Bart Simpson who said, when a man is so desperate, he doesn't know what to do, he turns to prayer. And you kind of wonder if our nation is so desperate to turn into prayer. Also, it feels like um, if you ever work in the forces, people talk about death a lot more. And therefore, they talk about salvation a lot more and they're more interested in that stuff. In our nation, often it feels like death's so far away and it's not really relevant. Whereas at the moment, people are talking about that more. And therefore, that makes a bigger difference in the here and now. Let's not miss this moment, waiting for it all to get back to normal. Which, by the way, it won't anyway. Yeah. And then just a third thing from, from page 95 of Unleashed. And this is about who's ministering alongside you, you know, and, and just having a little think in this season, perhaps, who's alongside me and what I'm doing? Um, are they the people that God's appointed? 
Um, are they the people I'm meant to be ministering with? Are they the people I'm, I'm meant to be serving with? Are we complementing one another? Are we able to freely use our gifts alongside one another? Are the things that, that we've squashed in order for other things to be released in other people? Like, what is God saying about the way that your gifts are working together in this season? Mm. Yeah, and, and also, learn to admire some stuff in some other people. Yeah. I've loved seeing the creativity of some of my friends coming up with all kinds of things in this season. I've loved seeing people live streaming services who never would have considered it before. Yes. I've loved to see some of the creativity in the home that people are having. You know, um, we have a window into people's lives through social media and other spaces. And it's a great opportunity not just to look for who's travelling with me, but also to affirm others. Yeah. I've absolutely loved in, in my role being able to contact some of my friends whose churches I would only ever go to perhaps if they invited me to speak. I'm able to see like during the week you can watch a church service at any point and you can send a message. So, you know, it's great the way you do that. Or it can be other stuff. You know, you might have someone working in NHS and you just want to encourage them or, or, or delight in what they're doing. Or, or even the guy who runs the shop opposite, we just want to encourage him because he's brilliant. Yeah. And poor fella's slaving away for the sake of everyone. And I think there is an opportunity to not just look for who to minister alongside, but who can you be encouraging, building up and sharing something of Jesus in that way with. Brilliant. And I think I think the difference is that, you know, the reason that we've looked at Acts and the reason that we continue to unpack Acts is because everything that unfolds is in the power of the Spirit. So I think what we really are, our heart cry and longing would be is that we hear the voice of God in mm-hmm. this, that that we hear, we sense the Spirit's prompting, that we're ignited and empowered by the Holy Spirit and and perhaps for some of us that has happened before, um, perhaps for others of us it's never happened, but that our hope would be that we are become increasingly aware of the presence of God in this time. And I, and I think that that's how we want to pray for you. Um, mm. And that's what, how we want to support you and help you. It is by saying, Lord, will you come? Spirit of the living God, would you would you move amongst your people? Lord, even now as we're speaking, Lord, that you bring to mind the people that you want me to think about right now. That you bring to mind the people who are isolated isolated Lord God the people who are on their own who I should reach out to and it's not that I have to but that it's I'm led by the spirit of God Lord that you bring to mind those I need to break bread with even if we do it in separate homes Lord that you bring to mind what your plan is what your purpose might be in this season Mm -hmm. and so Lord that that's our prayer um, that you increase now Lord we're sat here um, in our garden room back home but Father, we pray for an increase of your presence in every home, in every home of those watching. Father God, would you come right now, Spirit of the living God, we pray you would fall afresh upon us, upon your children. And Lord God, that we would just have a greater awareness of what you're saying and what you're doing. Lord, if there's people that we need to be working with and ministering alongside if there's people that we need to be drawing near um, if there's people Lord God that that you want us to unlock their gifts Lord would you just speak to us about them and Father we just say we're open to whatever you want to say in this time Father if we've been comparing ourselves Mm. forgive us Father God if we've been doing ourselves down Father forgive us Lord, for those who are isolated and alone right now, would you draw near to them, we pray. Father, would we be able to supernaturally model a togetherness like nothing we've seen before, Father? Yes, Lord. And Lord, we don't want to miss this moment. Mm. We don't want to miss this moment in our nation. We wouldn't have chosen this, but we find ourselves in a time where we need one another and we certainly need you. And so would you come by your spirit upon your children? Would you refuel, replenish, restore? And would you help us, Lord, to be the church you need in this moment? Would you help us to reach out to those over fences and yeah. around us? Would you help us to, to be community, even if it needs to be virtual for now? And would you help us to move forward in the power of your spirit mm-hmm. into all that the future holds? Maybe a little bit apprehensive as to what that is, but delighted that we know that you hold it in your hands and you will always be with us. Amen. Yeah, and, and Lord, we, we pray too just that you forgive us, Lord, for our own selfish ambition, 
for the way that we have sought to take care of ourselves and look after number one um, and we've made that our God, we've made ourselves our own priority. Um, Father, we pray that you would increase our selflessness um, in this season, that we would wake up thinking of others, thinking of you and thinking of others before we think of ourselves. And Lord, I just confess myself that I, I've just thought of myself too much, Lord. And, and I just pray, Father, equip us and enable us to think outside of ourselves more, Father, and to reach out in ways that are unique to the personality that you have given us, Lord. Mm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm. Mm. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've loved hanging out with you. We hope to see you again tomorrow. Hope you enjoy the rest of today's Spring Harvest Home. God bless you. Be unleashed and go out in the power of the Spirit for all that this day holds. Take oh, care. Amen. God bless.